And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker. Get your Bible out and turn to John chapter 5. We're doing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of John. And we're going to be starting today in chapter 5. I'm looking forward to this. There's a lot to get into today in chapter 5, and I can't wait to get into it. I've already drawn a lot up here for you. And uh, here's the birth of Jesus, and here's his death. And what we've seen so far, as we've gone through verse by verse, the book of John, we've seen that Jesus Christ is God. John tells us dogmatically, and in the very beginning of the book, that Jesus Christ was in the beginning. And in the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus Christ. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And guess what? He made all things. And so that's the first thing we learn in the book of John, is that Jesus is God, the Creator. In chapter 2 we see that Jesus is capable of doing some miracles, and he does some miracles. And a lot of people are, are like, wow, what a miracle. And I think it was a type of something, that miracle, because it wasn't the most miraculous of miracles. It was turning water into grape juice, but it was still a miracle, and we're going to see more miracles. And it's going to be amazing in all the miracles we're about to find out in his life. Then in chapter 3, we get into salvation and eternal life. And we see that Jesus Christ is God eternal in eternity past. So Jesus Christ existed in eternity past. And then he came down as God, and we find out again in chapter 1 that he is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In chapter 3 we see everlasting life and eternal life, and God giving that as a gift to certain people. And then in chapter 3 we find out that eternal life is through Jesus Christ, only through Him. And we're going to find out again today that He talks about eternal security. You know, all these people that run around and say, there's no such thing as eternal security. I have to wonder and I have to ask, do they even read their Bible? Because the Bible mentions eternal security over and over again, even from Jesus Christ. And we'll see that in this chapter as well, chapter 5. But in chapter 4, we find out that Jesus did not baptize anyone in water. He did not, for some reason. Why is that? Well, I believe it's because the Holy Spirit baptism was the more important one. We see that in the book of Acts. And we see how that's what's more important than water. In chapter 4, we found out that Jesus Christ is the Christ. He is the Messiah of Israel. He reveals that to this woman at the well. Then we also noticed, last time in chapter 4 that Jesus can heal the sick. And he's healed somebody in John chapter 4 and verse 48. And it was the son that was sick, and he healed a sick son. We, re we looked at that last time. So today we're going to see more of Jesus healing the sick in chapter 5. And we're going to see a lot of other interesting, important doctrines as well. So let's dive into it. John chapter 5 and verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, what was this feast? Well, I'm not going to get into it right here, but when we get to another one, I'm going to show you that it most likely was a feast of Passover. And there are several Passovers in the life of Jesus mentioned in the book of John, which points to him having a three-and-a-half-year ministry, it appears. So that's quite interesting. So there's a feast. So he went to a feast. He starts out going to a marriage feast. Now he's going to a feast of Israel. Now, verse 2 and verse 3, and sometimes verse 4, are taken out of new versions of the Bible. Now, why do they take these verses out? Well, because the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus omit these verses. Verse 2 and 3, and sometimes verse 4. You've got to watch out for those false Bible texts. I've done my best to, to explain to you that the King James comes from the true text, and other Bibles come from the false text. And I believe that the King James is from the right text. And they take this out, and it looks like because they don't believe it. They cannot swallow what we're about to see here. They just say, I just I can't believe that, so I can't put that in the Bible. Well, I believe it because it's there. And I think it's atrocious that people take this out. But it's a story about an angel, and an angel comes to the water, and when he leaves, people get healed by being the first one in the water. Now, whether you believe that or not, it's Scripture. And it's those two manuscripts, Vaticanus and City Atticus, that are so corrupt that take it out. But it's in the majority text. So I believe this really happened. I don't understand how an angel could heal someone. But this is what it says. So let's read it. Verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having seven porches. 
Now, in the back of my Bible, I have a Bible map. And my Bible map actually shows that. And I, hmm, I wonder if I can show you that so you get an idea of where that is. Here's my Bible, and here's the map. So let's see if we can zoom in on this map here. This is a map of where? This is a map of Jerusalem. And over here is Besed the Pool. So here's the temple. So it's a good little walk outside the temple going up north. And you go up north, and there it is. So it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, to be honest with you. And so it's kind of neat when you're reading your Bible to look on a map and see where it is that it's talking about. Those places still exist today and are still over there in, in Jerusalem. I'd love to go over there and see if you can still find that pool of Bethesda. But the Bible says here, and we're reading in John chapter 5, Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Now that's ominous because five is the number of death. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, so many questions. Was this an angel of the Lord or the angel of the devil? That's a good question. We know God can do miracles, and God can certainly use an angel to do a miracle. But can the devil do a miracle? Well, in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist comes doing miracles. So you've got to be careful of things like this. So is this an angel of God, or is this a fallen angel? Hmm, I, I don't know. But let's assume that it's an angel of the Lord. Well, what is it doing there? Why does it come at a certain season? Well, it's a Jewish feast, so could it come every year for a feast of Israel? I, I don't know. It's a lot of questions here. But... Uh, it says here that there were some sick people. Now notice what it says, impotent folk. Now, we look at the word impotent nowadays, and what do we think? Instantly you think of Viagra or Cialis, or whatever that stuff is called, Cialis. And you think of that, and, and it's been used almost as a dirty word. But that's not what it means. Impotent means weak, feeble, or disabled. Okay, so you don't have to change the Bible. You just have to define terms. Look this up in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary and you'll find it. And people with a dirty mind usually think dirty thoughts. And they see the word impotent, they kind of go, hee 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 hee, because they think of a man being impotent in his older uh, years. But it's not talking about that. This word was around way before it had that context. And impotent means disabled, weak, or feeble. So you had your disabled people, or weak, or feeble people. You had blind, you had halt. Halt means not walking or limping. They're unable to walk or walk freely because they have some problem with their legs. See, there's no problem with the Old English. People say, oh, the King James is too hard to understand. No, not really. It, it, you understand. Someone's coming at you, you go, halt. <laughs> that means stop walking. So someone who's halt is someone who can't walk or can't walk well. Or withered. Now, what does withered mean? It means faded, wrinkled, wasted away, or decayed. So it looks like you have some people here that might have been born this way, some people here that got sick later in life and became like this, and some people that were completely wasting away, probably because of some sin that they did. Because the wages of sin is death, and guess what? You reap what you sow, so you live a life of sin, you might have these infirmities because of your sin. There are many infirmities out there that people can get from living a loose lifestyle. So you had all these people coming, and all they wanted was to get healed of their infirmity. And now verse um, 3, it says they're waiting for the moving of the water. So somehow this angel came down. I don't know if the angel bathed in the water or what he did. Maybe this was the Lord having grace on Israel, and every year he sent an angel and says, Now whoever's the first gets healed. I, I don't know. All I know is the Bible says it's true, so I believe it. So this angel moved the water, and then I guess it went back up to heaven. And for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So all these sick people are all in one place, and they're all trying to get in that water first. Can you imagine that scene? If some of them can't walk, some of them are disabled, some of them are weak. Can you imagine them trying to push each other and, oh, me first, no, me first, no. And it had to have been a scene, man. It had to have been something to see. And so here in verse 4, it's the angel, and these people are trying to do this. Now, 
there's one man that was sig signaled out in this scene, and that was this fellow, verse 5, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. So 38 years he had his infirmity. Now that doesn't mean he was 38 years old. He could have lived before that, before he had his infirmity. And it appears, as we're going to read down a little bit later, that this infirmity may have been something he got because of his sin. Maybe he got into sin and got, I don't know, gonorrhea or some sexually transmitted disease, and that made him fall ill. And so it was because of his sin that he got sick. And I say that perhaps because of what we're about to read here in a little bit, what Jesus says to him later. So be sure your sin will find you out. All right? And the Bible says you reap what you sow. The more you sin, the more you'll expect to pay for it in this life and in the flesh. All right? And then it says here in verse 6, When Jesus saw him lie, so he was lying down, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now what was this guy thinking? He's thinking, is he going to pick me up and take me there first? Because he looks like an able-bodied individual. Maybe he is going to grab me and throw me in first, and I'll be the one that gets healed. That's what he was thinking, most likely. The impotent man, what does that mean? That means the man who was weak and feeble and disabled, unable to walk on his own to be able to be the first one in. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But when I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Now this happens every so often, maybe every year. So has this guy been trying to come for 38 years in a row? Was this his 38th year there, trying to be healed? And yet he couldn't find somebody that cared enough about him to pick him up and put him in? I don't know. Maybe I'm reading between the lines, but he was sick for some time, and he's been trying to get well. So you look at this man, and it looks like others beat him to it. But Jesus knew. Somehow, Jesus knew. And Jesus talked to him. And Jesus knew him. Hmm, I find that interesting. Verse 6. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time. Now, how did Jesus know? Did somebody whisper in his ear, Oh, that's so-and-so. He's been here for 38 years. He's been sick for 38 years. Or did Jesus know because Jesus is God and he knows all things? So, verse 8 says, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now, who is speaking? Jesus Christ, who is God, manifest in the flesh. And when God speaks, it happens. All God had to do was say, Let it be. In the beginning, God said, Let there be light. Let there be this. Let there be that. Boom. Boom. It came into existence. Genesis 1.1. And uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, John 1, 1 through 3, Jesus Christ is God. And what is he? He's the Word. And with his Word, he created all things. So Jesus just speaks, and it happens. Boy, this, if this doesn't prove that Jesus is God, I don't know what is. Because Jesus just says, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And boom, he obeyed. And he's walking around going, I can walk now? This is awesome. And he was healed. By the word of Jesus Christ. It doesn't even say that Jesus had to touch him. He just said, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So he's walking, and he's walking on the Sabbath. Now, if you know your history, and you know the Jewish law, you're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. So he must have come there the day before. So he probably slept there all night, and was waiting there. Just enough to pull himself into the pool, to get healed. Well, if he had pulled himself into the pool and gotten healed, then he still couldn't have walked the next day until the next day. <laughs> so he's kind of in a conundrum, but he doesn't care. He just wants to be healed. Well, Jesus heals him and says, now you go pick up your bed and walk. Well, when the Jews saw this, they were like, what is this guy doing? He's doing work. He's carrying a bed on the Sabbath day. This isn't right. So look what it says in verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Shows the Pharisees have no concerns for souls. You mean, you would have thought maybe they looked at that and go, Whoa, is that the guy that was sick for 38 years? No, they didn't even care who he was. They're just like, what are you doing, man, carrying a bed? That's not supposed to be done during the time of the law, during the Sabbath. So, they obviously didn't care about the man, but Jesus did. Now look at verse 11. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. So he said, I'm just doing what I was told. 
And uh, he should have said, and by the way, he healed me. <laughs> but he didn't. It, at least it doesn't tell us that he said that. But it can, insinuates it there in verse 13. He that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. So, But it sounds later, as we continue to read, that somehow it came out that he was healed. But he's just like, you know what, I'm just obeying God. I'm doing what I told. Now this gets us into the teaching of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath, you need to know what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath is Saturday. The Sabbath is the last day of the week. That is the Sabbath, the last day of the week. Now, the Sabbath is a Jewish thing for Jewish people. There's no Sabbath for us today in the church age. And I say that dogmatically, having read the Bible and knowing the Scriptures. And if you know your Bible too, then you know that we don't keep the Sabbath today. But there are people out there that say, no, 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 we're still under the Sabbath, we're still under the Sabbath. Well, we have a problem then. We have a great, big problem if we're still under the Sabbath. And I'm going to get into that, I'm going to show you more about that as well. But let's go to Matthew 28 and verse 1. I want you to see that when Jesus rose again, he rose again on the first day of the week, not the last day of the week. And you look at any calendar, I've got a calendar over there, on any and every calendar, the first day of the week is Sunday. And the seventh day of the week, the last day of the week, is the Sabbath. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday is the last day of the week. So Saturday is the last day at the end of the week, then you start all over again on Sunday. But Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead, and that's why we as Christians remember Sunday instead of the Sabbath. And it says in Matthew 28, 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So the first day of the week, the Sabbath being over. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door. So Jesus rose again, when? On Sunday. And we see in the Bible a pattern of them going on Sunday and worshiping and not Saturday. And I'm going to show you those verses here in a minute. But let me show you this. The Sabbath is a part of the law, and the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. And the question arises, are we under the law of Moses today? And the answer, according to the Bible, is no. We're no longer under the Old Testament. We're under the New Testament. You see, the Testament starts at the death of a testator. So Jesus died. So everything after that is New Testament. Everything before that is Old Testament. And the Old Testament was all about the Old Testament law. Well, Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law, the Bible says. So let's look at this. Look at the Ten Commandments. And people say, well, I know the Ten Commandments were just for Israel, but they're still applied to us today. All right, let's, let's look at that, and let's figure out if that's right. Because if we're under the Ten Commandments, then we're still under the law of Moses. And that's part of our salvation, is keeping these commandments. And if that's the case, then we're not saved by grace through faith, we're saved by keeping the commandments. See the problem we have there with that? So in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, under the house of bondage. First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Third commandment, down here in verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. And it continues speaking there, but it says that the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now the fifth commandment is honor thy father and mother. Sixth commandment, verse 13, thou shalt not kill. Seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Ninth commandment, verse 16, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And then the tenth commandment is verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or other things. Wife, man, man servant, things like that. So we have the Ten Commandments given here in the Old Testament, and the Fourth Commandment is the Sabbath. So the keeping of the Sabbath is the Fourth Commandment. Now, people today say you got to keep the Ten Commandments, and they're still for us today. So do we keep the Sabbath day? Well, I don't know very many people that do that are Gentiles. Many Gentiles, they go do stuff on Saturday. 
A lot of times that's your day to get out, drive in the car, go have a picnic, go to the beach, go do stuff, go garage sailing in my case. And Sunday is the day that we set apart as Christians for going to church, not Saturday. And because of that, there are some people out there that say, well, this, this is evil. Uh, you guys are not serving God and you're not following the Bible because you're not keeping the Sabbath day. And then I say, man, you don't read your Bible, do you? Do you know we don't have to keep the Sabbath today according to the Bible? Do you know that we are no longer under the Ten Commandments? Did you know that? I mean, if you didn't know that, then you should know that before you go scream aloud, Oh, you're bad, you're not keeping the Sabbath. All right, let's look at what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 13. Jesus Christ shows up. And when he does, in his earthly ministry, he's showing up to start a new dispensation. He's going to start a new covenant with Israel. So this is what the Bible teaches, and you need to know this. Matthew eleven thirteen. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So the law and the prophets were all up until John. Then what? Well, then things began to change, and there's a transition period taking place. Let's go over to Luke sixteen sixteen. So to try to get people back under the Old Testament law, that's not right. And that's what the whole book of Galatians is written about, is that we're not under the Old Testament law. But Luke 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. So the law and the prophets were until John. That, of course, would be John the Baptist. So the law and the prophets were until John. So are we still under the law? Are we still under this keeping of the Sabbath? Well, let's look at some more verses. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 17. John 1, 17. The law was given by Moses... But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So we see a distinction here. We see a very big distinction, actually, between the law and Moses, all for Israel, and then Jesus coming, and then for the church. So we see two different dispensations. So now we have Paul in the Bible. And Paul's telling us some things. And you know what Paul tells us? Paul tells us we're no longer under the law. So all these people that you hear running around saying, we're still under the law, we've still got to keep the fourth commandment, we've still got to keep the Sabbath, they do not know what they're talking about. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, let me show you. Romans chapter 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So I'm no longer under that Old Testament law, so I don't have to keep the fourth commandment according to the Bible. Let me show you another verse. I'm going to show you a lot of verses here. Go to Colossians chapter 2. And in Colossians chapter 2, we read this. Colossians 2, 14. Jesus died for what? Verse 13, to forgive you all trespasses. It says, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's what he did on the cross. It was to forgive you all your sins. But verse 14 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So where is the law today? It has been taken out of the way. He's talking about the law of Moses, and it says, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. So Jesus died to redeem us from the curse of the law, so we are no longer under the law for salvation. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. You've got to understand this, because there's a certain denomination out there that calls themselves the Seventh-day Adventists. And they pride themselves on trying to keep the Sabbath. And they don't even realize that that was for Israel back then and is not for us today. I'm going to prove that to you here in the scriptures. But let's read Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Did you catch that? You are not under the law. Are we under the law today? No, we're under grace. Now some people will say, well, well Brother Breaker, you're... Well, you're saying I can go and do whatever I want. I don't have to obey the Ten Commandments. Why, well, I can go do whatever sin I want? No, that's not what I'm saying. The commandments are great, and they're very moral. There's some moral law there. But that's not for us today. We're no longer under that law. But that's not an excuse to sin. See, that's what they'll accuse you of. Oh, you're against the Sabbath? Well, you think it's okay to sin, don't you? You're against the law. No, look at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Now that we're saved by grace, we don't want to sin. And there are a lot of sins in the Bible that tells us what sin is, so we try to keep from doing those sins. So we try to keep away from those sins and keep from doing those sins. But is this one a moral law or is this a ceremonial law? 
And what does the law actually say about keeping the Sabbath? I'm going to show you that here in a second. But before we do, let's go to Romans chapter 13. Because Paul, who is our apostle today, according to Romans 11, 13, Paul reiterates to us some commands. And you know what he does? He gives us a lot of the Ten Commandments for us today. But he leaves one out. Isn't that interesting? I wonder why. Romans chapter 13 and verse 8. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Romans 13, 8 says... Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. I'm going to count how many he says here. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So of the Ten Commandments, Paul gives us only five of them. And he says, now if you're going to do something, do it because you love the Lord. So we're in the Spirit today when we're saved. We walk in the Spirit that we fulfill not the lust of the flesh, and we don't follow the flesh. And we do what we do because we love the Lord, not because we have to do it. Now that brings us to this question. Do we keep the fourth commandment today? And the answer is no. And let me show you why. Because in Exodus chapter 31, we are straight up told that it is for the Jews. It's for Israel. If you're not Israel, then you don't have to keep the fourth commandment because it's not for you. It's for them. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 12. And I'm going to read verse 12 all the way down to verse 18. And this is all about the Sabbath. And let me tell you what this says. Because if you, listen to me, Mr. Seventh-day Adventist, if you tell me that we have to keep the Sabbath today, then you are evil. Because if you want to keep the Sabbath, you have to do everything that this says about the Sabbath. And if you do that, you will be a sinner of the greatest sort. Look what it says accompanies this keeping of the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So Moses, tell your people, tell the Jews, it's between me and the Jews, for them. Verse 14, Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Uh-oh. <laughs> so if this is for us today, in the church age, after the cross, and we have to keep the fourth commandment, then do we go and kill other Christians who are not obeying the fourth commandment? No! A thousand times no. I say, don't you ever do that. But if you are one of those that is trying to get us back under the law, then that's what the law says. Kill those that don't keep the commandments of keeping the Sabbath. Um, how could that possibly be for us today? That doesn't sound like grace. Remember, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Does that sound like grace to you? Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is people don't understand dispensations. That was for them then, under the law, and it was only for Israel. So this keeping of the Sabbath was under the Old Testament law, and it was for Israel. And we're not under that Old Testament law. We're under grace. So that means we no longer have to keep the Sabbath today, because that was for them. Because the Sabbath carries with it the death penalty. And if that was for today, then you'd have Christians running around killing other Christians that leave their house on Saturday. Do you think that's right, or do you think they'd be in jail for murder? Well, rightly so, they would be in jail for murder. So this is for the Jews then, not for us now. Now let me continue reading here again. It says there in verse 14, shall surely be put to death. And then it says in verse 15, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. You going to do that, are you? If you are, you are evil. And you do not rightly divide your Bible because rightly dividing shows us that we're no longer under the law, we're under grace, and we don't do that. We don't go around killing people that don't keep the Sabbath. Because this is why, verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Who? Does it say the church? Does it say the body of Christ shall do this? No, it says Israel. So that was for the Jews. Verse 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So this is a sign for Israel. Verse 18, And he gave it to Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So there's your Ten Commandments in stone. And that fourth one was for Israel. That is not for us today, because it carries with it the death penalty. The D penalty. And you're going to tell me that we're still under that today? No, I'm not going to go kill people. Because I can read my Bible and understand and rightly divide and say, Whoa, that was for the Jews then, not for us now. Okay? I hope you are smart enough to rightly divide the word of truth. You can't keep the Sabbath today, otherwise you'd have to stone those who don't keep it. The Sabbath is for Israel, not for the church. And Paul reiterates that in his ministry. And you know we're under Paul's ministry today? And look what Paul says in the book of Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. You see these Seventh-day Adventists, they run around and they judge you. And they say, oh, you're not good, you're not a good Christian because you're not keeping the Sabbath. They're judging you. But they won't even read and tell you what it entails to keep the Sabbath. Because if you want to keep the Sabbath, then there's the death penalty for those that don't. So do they want to kill you? Is that what they want? Do they want to put you under a system to where you can die if you do that? That's horrible. So look what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. Colossians 2, 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. These seventh-day Adventists run around and say, Oh, you're not a good Christian. You don't keep the Sabbath. Are you judging me? <laughs> um, Paul tells me, you have no right to judge me based upon what day I decide to go to church. So who do you think you are to tell me I have to keep the Sabbath? No, I don't. That was the law for Israel back then. This is for us today. And Paul does tell us, don't kill, don't steal, don't... He reiterates some of the other ten ones, but he leaves this one out. Why? Because things changed. There was a great change that took place. Let's go over to Romans chapter 14 and verse 6. Romans 14, 6, Paul says this. Paul says, you can choose for yourself what day you want to keep for the Lord. You don't have to keep that Old Testament Israeli Sabbath mandated by Moses under the law to Jews, not to us. Romans chapter 14 and verse 6 says, He that regardeth a day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. And it continues on there with some more stuff. But basically, you can choose which day you want to give to the Lord. For me, it's Sunday. But you go to this Seventh-day Adventist church, which, by the way, started in a sanatorium in Battle Creek, Michigan. I've seen the building. Do you know what a sanatorium is? It's a crazy house. That's where they started that church, Miller and Millerism. And Miller started by giving a false date for the second coming of Jesus. Hmm. Interesting. False prophet he was. And yet, but yet, all over the world, there's Seventh-day Adventists. All over the world, there's people that follow that man and believe that they're still under the law. Well, okay, then they're the biggest hypocrites that ever lived because the law they claim to be under says death penalty to those that don't keep it. And yet they don't practice that. So they don't even practice what they claim to believe. Is there a greater hypocrite? <laughs> I don't know. I will never practice that because I rightly divide and I see, oh, that was for the Jews back then? Oh, we're the church over here, so we don't keep that. What day do we, as the church, keep? Do we keep Saturday or do we keep Sunday? Well, we keep Sunday. Now, if you go to Seventh-day Adventist church, they will say, well, that's the mark of the beast. And the Catholic Church and uh, the Pope, they're the ones that started Sunday worship, they say. And so that's the mark of the beast, and you should never go to church on Sunday. Sunday worship is wrong, they say. Strike two. Again, they have shown that they do not read their Bible. If you read the Bible, you find the early church, way before the Catholic Church, the true believers of the early church coming together and meeting on Sunday. Why do they choose to go on Sunday now rather than Saturday? Because you go to the temple on Saturday, you go to church on Sunday. And I'm going to prove that to you in the Bible. Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. Mark 16, 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, 
He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So, did you read that? When Jesus was risen early the first day of the week. First day of the week is Sunday. So when Jesus rose again on Sunday, so Jesus rose on Sunday. Hmm. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday is when Jesus rose again. And that is why we Christians want to go to church on Sunday because we want to remember the day, the first day of the week. Put him first, not last. We want to put him first and remember him the first day of the week because that's the day that he rose from the dead. Now, Look at John chapter 20 and verse 19, because after Jesus rose from the dead, he went up to heaven. But he came down about a week later and appeared to his disciples. And guess which day he appeared? He didn't appear on Saturday. He appeared on the first day of the week. John chapter 20 and verse 19. In John 20 19, the same day at even, being the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. Jesus appears to his disciple on Sunday, not on Saturday. Isn't that interesting? Now go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we read this. Acts 20 and verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, read it a part of the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. They're having a Sunday meeting. Was that the mark of the beast, huh? Was Paul the mark of the beast? Well, this is before the Catholic Church. Don't give me this lie made up by men in their false denomination that going to church on Sunday is the mark of the beast when we have over and over and over again in the Bible itself the early Christians going to church on Sunday. They're meeting together on Sunday. Paul even says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I don't see how anyone can fall for this lie that these people say if they just read their Bible. But Paul even tells them to lay aside an offering to give when they go to church on Sunday. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So you lay in store, so you put it aside on Sunday. So you take up an offering in church on Sunday, then you lay that in store till he comes, then the offering they give to Paul. So Sunday worship. So watch out for these Seventh-day Adventists and their Millerism because they are mixing the law with grace and trying to get you back under an Old Testament law that was to Jews that carries the death penalty, according to Exodus chapter 31. That's, that's creepy. That's scary. That's wrong on so many levels. And they're trying to get you to go to church on Saturday when all through the New Testament people are going to church on Sunday. And it's biblical. Now, let's go back to John chapter 10. I had to divert there to that and get that out there because I deal with these people all the time, and you probably will too. You'll probably come across someone like that. And you know what I like to do when they try to talk to me? They say, hey, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I go to church on Saturday. I go, kill anybody lately? <laughs> oh, that freaks them out. And I take them to Exodus 31. I say, you believe in keeping the Sabbath? When did you kill anybody? And they kind of look at me and scratch their head and go, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you got in the wrong religion, didn't you? Maybe it's time to get out because they are teaching lies instead of the truth. John chapter 5 and verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. All right, and I went and I showed you that verse where they're not supposed to do that. It's not lawful for them to do things on the Sabbath day because they were still during that time where they still thought they were under the law of Moses because they were Israel. But then it says here, He answered them, verse 11, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. They Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. So we have kind of a secret healing here. Jesus comes over, heals him, just kind of goes, have a nice day, and walks away. And everyone's going, who was that? What, what happened? You got healed? Tell me about it. Who did it? And they're trying to figure this whole thing out. So the man who was cured didn't know who Jesus was at the time. And he was in the Jewish temple when he was there. Now in verse 14, we see Jesus coming into the temple. Look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So here we see him saying, Hey, don't sin anymore, because you might just have something worse happen. 
Is that insinuating that the reason he was sick to begin with was because he sinned? I don't know, but that's what it sounded like. So the man who was cured didn't know who Jesus was at the time. And he's in the Jewish temple telling the people about it, and then Jesus shows up. And uh, then he's going to say, hey, th there's, there's Jesus. And, and then he goes, that's the guy. And they're like, oh, oh, the Jesus fella. And Jesus tells him, look, don't sin anymore, lest the worst thing come upon thee. So that, like I said, that makes me think, could sin have caused his ailment? Possibly. The reason he was sick is because he was living a wicked lifestyle. It's perhaps. That's reading between the lines, but that's what it sounds like. Some people are sick, and they're born sick. Some people are sick just because of chance. Other people are sick because of their sin. And so it sounds like this guy was sick because he did something evil, is what it sounds like. Now we continue in verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Whew. The man told the Jews it was Jesus who healed him. You think they would have gone to Jesus and said, Yay, good job! No, they went to him and started persecuting him. Said, we're going to kill you. Why would they do that? Why would they want to slay him? Well, because he did something good. So they wanted to persecute him for doing good. They didn't want to kill him because he did wrong. They wanted to kill him because he did good. <laughs> but they were thinking in their mind, well, the law says not to do that. So you're helping a guy break the law. Well, the guy that wrote the law, God, showed up. And he can do whatever he wants, right? Isn't he above the law because he's the one that gave the law? And didn't he come to change it to grace and truth? rather than the law? Didn't he come to give them a new covenant and a new dispensation? So why can't Jesus do that? He can. And so he's trying to show them that he is God manifest in the flesh. But there's a lot of those people there that were upset and angry and were so mad. And according to the law, they had every right to try to go ahead and kill him because you're to be stoned. I had it written down here somewhere, but I guess I can't find it. But under the Old Testament law, when a man did work on the Sabbath, he was to be stoned to death. So they were trying to say, hey, we're just following the law here, you know. But Jesus goes, no, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, then they come, and then they're two-faced because of what they say next. Starting at verse 16, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now, let's go ahead and read verse 18. Now, watch this. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. This would be blasphemy if it was not true. But how did Jesus try to make himself equal with God? Well, he says there in verse 14, Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon thee. So his doing a miracle and his telling a guy to quit sinning made them think, is he saying he's God? <laughs> well, yeah, it sounds like it. So Jesus Christ is God. And in their eyes, they only saw a man. They didn't see God manifest in the flesh. So they're saying, who are you to say you're God? You're just a man. They didn't realize that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. And that's sad. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto. And I work. So Jesus Christ is working, but he's working through the Father. And the Father is working through him. And so he's saying, the Father, the Father. Well, they understood that as Father God. And so they're saying, God's working through you, and I work. So I'm working as God. Somehow in there, they got the idea that Jesus Christ is saying, I am God. Now, is Jesus Christ God? Yes, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God in the form of the Son. The Father is God in the form of the Father. And the Holy Ghost is God in the form of the Holy Spirit. And that makes up one God in three. But those three are one. That's the doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity doctrine, we call it. And there's a lot of people that believe in the Trinity, that believe that. There are a lot of people today that will lie to you and try to say, no, the Trinity is three different gods. I don't believe that. I never even heard that before. When I heard of the Trinity, I heard it means one God in three. Three and one and one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. But people today, they take the word Trinity and they say, that's wrong, you shouldn't say that word, it's not in the Bible. Well, according to that line of thought, then we shouldn't use the word rapture, because that's not in the Bible. 
<laughs> you see, these people, they like to attack words. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about that we're not supposed to strive in, in, in words to change them uh, to things that don't profit and things like that. But the Bible teaches that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, that's all one God, but one God in three separate manifestations. So God can separate himself into three manifestations. And we're going to look at that here in a minute. But they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill God. Because they said that he was making himself equal with God. They understood that Jesus said he was the Son of God, and they understood that as that as him saying he was indeed God. So he's the Son of God. He's God, comma, the Son. Because he's God in the form of the Son. While in heaven is God in the form of the Father. And that's what the Godhead doctrine is. And the Godhead doctrine is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So we're going to get into that today. We've got the Father... We've got the Son, and we've got the Holy Ghost. And God consists of all three, but these three are one. And over there in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 26 and verse 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 27, the Bible says this, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Verse 27, I skipped a little bit to get to verse 27. So God says, let us in our. God refers to himself in the plural. Why? Because God is one, but yet he can divide himself into three, but still be one. Now that's a good trick. I wish I could do that. <laughs> but uh, I can't. But God can. God can separate himself into three separate manifestations at one time and still be one God. Let's turn over to uh, 1 John 5, 7 and see that. 1 John 5, 7, which, by the way, is taken out of some new versions of the Bible. Or part of it is taken out. The Jehovah Witness Bible takes it out completely because Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. So I guess if Jesus came today, they would be the same ones who were trying to kill him for saying that he was God. Hmm. Because the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, and they do not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, one God and three, and these three are one. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, well, that's John 1, and 1 through 3, that's Jesus Christ. So the Father, the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Notice it doesn't say these three are three separate gods. It doesn't say that. It says it's one God who is able to somehow separate himself into these three, but yet these three are one. So God said, let us make man in our image. So let's go look over here at, at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And the question is, what is God? Well, he's one in three and three in one. Okay, so what are we? If God made us in his image, then how would we turn out? Well, somehow we're made similar. So if he's one in three, then we're one in three, but yet we're one, but yet we consist of three. And at first... Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we read, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, God has three parts. And we have three parts. What are we? We're a body. But it mentions soul first. We're a soul, a body, and a spirit. And that's me. So that's me, a human being. So I am a triune being. You see that? I consist of three. That's where tri comes from. But yet I am one. I am only one me. I am just one. So I am one, but I am three. God is one, but he's three. So God said he made us in his image. So God has some sort of an image in which he's three, but he's one. Well, if we're a body, soul, and spirit, does that correspond? Well, we know God is the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God must be the Holy Spirit. We know Jesus came down in the form of a body, so the body must be Jesus. And then that just leaves the soul. So is the Father the soul of God? And so when God made us, is that how he made us? You see, God made a spirit world, and God made a physical world. So the spirit world... Well, the Father is in the spirit world, and the Son too, but the Son can come down in the body of a physical world. So he can come and be in this world, in the physical world, in his body. 
But he's also a spirit that can be in both. And the spirit likes to inhabit bodies, which is amazing. When you get saved, you get sealed with the Holy Spirit. So I see the doctrine of the Godhead. I see this doctrine of the Godhead, or I call it a trinity. Now, some people today, they attack that. So you shouldn't use the word trinity. I think that's so stupid. What they do is they go to the Catholic doctrine and they say, Catholics believe in trinity. So if they believe it, we can't believe it. Okay, Catholics believe in the virgin birth. So if they believe it, we can't believe it. Is that right? According to your argument, logically, then we must be against the virgin birth, right? That's how people go to such an extreme, they get messed up. And so there's people out there today who say, you shouldn't use the word trinity. And they say it's a Catholic word. Well, the Catholic Church officially begins at about 325 A.D. So you go to the internet and you look up, when did the word Trinity show up? hundred and something after Jesus, way before the Catholic Church. But some people say, but you can't use Trinity because it's Catholic. And you're like, but it shows up the word before, <laughs> before the Catholic. There's people out there that are just, they're insane, folks. So what we've got to do is we've got to stick with the King James Bible. We've got to go by what it teaches. And a lot of people, they just want to argue about this doctrine of the Trinity. But God made us in His image, so God is one God in three, but these three are one. Now, some people use the word persons. One God in three persons. Do you know I don't have a problem with that? But some people do. In the King James Bible, the Father is called a person, the Son is called a person, and the Holy Ghost is personified as a person. Let me show you that real quick. I just find that interesting. I like to use the term manifestations. So God can manifest himself in three different ways. Okay, But in the Bible, God is three persons, but yet he's still one. He's not three separate persons that are three separate gods. He's one God who can separate himself into three different manifestations. And if you looked at those, you'd say that's a person. So let me show you these verses on that. Well, first, before we go to these verses on, on that, let's go to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. Matthew 3, 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove upon him. So the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descending onto Jesus. And then watch what happens. Verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven, hmm, that would be the Father in heaven, speaking from heaven. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So do you see how God can be one God, but be in three different places at one time? That's what he can do, because that's God. God can do whatever God wants to do. So if God is one God that can split himself into three, then more power to him. That does not make three different gods. That makes an all-powerful God that can do whatever he wants. Amen. Now let's go over to Hebrews chapter 1, and there's some people out there today with all their hullabaloo running around saying the Trinity is a false doctrine, the Trinity is a false doctrine. And you know what? You listen to what they say and you can't help but laugh. They say that when you teach the Trinity, you're preaching and teaching three different gods. I've never believed that. I don't know anybody that teaches that who believes in the doctrine of the Trinity. There might be some, but I've never met them. I went to Bible school, and I was taught there this doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity, and I was not taught, and there's three different gods. I was taught those three are one. In fact, in fact Dr. Ruckman used to say, three and one and one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. Well, that'd be this one right here, Jesus. So I believe in one God in three, but those three are one. I am one person. I exist of three, but I'm only one. You say, well, you're not three different persons. No, I'm not. I'm one person. But I'm going I'm to explain that to you here in a second. I want to show you something. But look at what the Bible says. The Bible does teach one God and three persons because it uses the term person in speaking of each one of these. And then it personifies the Holy Spirit. Let me show you that quickly. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 6, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Well, that would be God the Father. How do we know that's the Father? Because it says in verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And so verse 3, speaking of the Son, says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person <laughs> and upholding of things by the word of his power. So Jesus Christ, the Son, is the express image of the person of the Father. So the Father is called a person in the King James Bible. Isn't that interesting? Now, Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Got to watch out for these people that change doctrine and attack doctrine. They claim to be...
King James Bible believers, and yet they're not even reading the King James Bible. The Father is referred to as a person. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Paul refers to Jesus Christ, and he says he's a person. So the Father is called a person, and the Son is called a person. How about the Holy Spirit? Well, let's go to John chapter 14. Nowhere in the King James Bible does it say that the Holy Spirit is a person. But there's something interesting in the King James Bible as it personifies the Holy Spirit, and it makes it a capital. So John chapter 14, and verse 16. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father... And he will give you another comforter, capital C, that he may abide with you forever. Now you can read verse 26, and you can go to chapter 15 and verse 26 as well. But here is a personification. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Well, the comforter was Jesus because he comforted them there on the earth. Now the other comforter, another, would be this one. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these two are called persons, and this one would have to be a person in the sense that it was personified as another. Okay? Now, is it okay to say that one God and three persons? Sure. There's no problem with that. God the Father was up in heaven, and you look at him as a person up there. The Son comes down, and he's like a person down here. And the Holy Ghost is personified. It does not make three different gods when you refer to one God in three persons. Let me give you an example of this, okay? Here's my dad, okay? My dad passed away. So here's my dad here. My dad was a saved man. My dad died, and my dad died, and his soul went up here to heaven. So his soul is up here in heaven, and his body is down here in the grave. Now, he's separated. One person is my dad, but now his physical body is here and his spiritual body is up there, the soul. When he died, he went up to heaven and somebody in heaven looks over and he says, hey, who's that person right there? Because they see his soul in heaven. They say, who's that person? At the same time my dad dies and we go to the funeral, some guy comes to the funeral and he says, who's that person? Does that mean there's two different persons? Is my dad two different human beings? Or is he still the same dad, but yet he's divided now? And in this aspect, we look at him in heaven and see his soul, and we say, look at that person. And yet down here, in the physical world, not the spirit world, we see his body, and we say, who was that person? And we use the word person. We're not making two different fathers, two different human beings. It's the same one. It's just we look at it as two different persons, in the sense that they're divided, and one has his personage over here, one has his personage here, and we can see them differently in a different light, and yet they're still the same. That's my dad in heaven, his soul. That's my dad, his body, here on earth. So when it comes back together, well, it's one again, but right now it's divided. And it's all depending on how you look at it. And the way I look at it is that one God can divide himself into three separate manifestations, I don't have a problem using the term persons, but still be one. And that's the doctrine of the Trinity or the Godhead. Do you believe in that doctrine? Some people today don't. It's the same person, but he has been separated by his spiritual self that is in heaven, while his physical body is here on the earth. Viewed as one person in each realm, but still being one. So my dad, he's viewed down here as a person or what's left of him, his body. But in heaven he's viewed as a person because he's a person up there, his soul. But he's still one. He's not two separate people. He's the same one. He's the same, but yet he's divided. So if that can happen with a human, that can certainly happen with God. So there's nothing wrong with the doctrine of the Trinity and saying it's one God and three persons. It is wrong if you try to make it three separate gods. But I've never met anyone who teaches the doctrine of the Trinity where they say it's three gods, not one God. Now, God is one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord says that he is one. Let me read this to you real quick. I'm going to go over today, I guess. And that's okay, because i got a lot more next time to get into. But Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Don't ever, ever let anyone talk you out of the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity 
and tell you that, oh, you're lost or you can't have fellowship with someone that believes in the Trinity. If you're saved and I'm saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can believe this. But some people, they always try to go to an extreme with something. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, and the Bible says this, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 43. A lot of your cults, a lot of your cults, get messed up on the doctrine of the Trinity, and they don't understand it. And once they get messed up on the doctrine of the Trinity, from then on, it's just false doctrine, false doctrine, false doctrine, false doctrine. And that's the doctrines they get off on. The first one is the Trinity. Then they start getting off on other doctrines. So be careful of those that attack the doctrine of the Trinity. Isaiah 43, 3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. Now look at verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Now a lot of people look at this and say, well, that's the Lord of the Old Testament, so that's the Father. Okay. All right, well, let's look at this then. Go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. And Philippians 3.20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, comma, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the Lord. And the Father is the Lord. And it's the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. So it's all one God. That's all one God, folks. There's not three different gods. And that's one God. But God can do something, which a lot of people can't do. He can separate himself into three separate manifestations. And he has done that. So the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one God who can manifest himself in different ways, or you can use the word persons, if you want, as he wishes. So that's the Trinity or the Godhead doctrine. In fact, the Bible uses the term Godhead three times, Acts 17, 29, Romans 1, 20, and Colossians 2, 9. Now back to the book of John real quick. And we'll stop here in just a second. John chapter 5, and uh, John chapter 5 and verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. But he is equal with God, because the Holy Ghost is God, the Son is God, and the Father is God. And they're all co-equal, and they're all one God. Just as I am my soul, and I am my body, and my spirit is inside me. I'm that one. If it divides, that's still me. But you might go to heaven and say, hey, look at that person over there. It's Robert Breaker. And somebody still might be down here and look, look at the grave and say, hey, there's that, that Robert Breaker guy. That was a good person. And they use the word person to apply to both. That doesn't make two of me. I'm still the one. But that's the different viewpoint, the spiritual and the physical. So Jesus is equal with God. Jesus Christ is God. 1 Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Matthew 1.23 says that his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus is God. They are rejecting God right here in verse 18. They are literally rejecting God in the flesh. And that's a shame. They're wanting to kill God. So the very men that were chosen by God to be the leaders of the people that God chose are against the very God that chose them. That's so sad. Now, being equal with God. Jesus Christ is not some separate lesser God. Okay, He's not another God. He is God. That is part of the doctrine of the Godhead. Now, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, though, many people have asked this question. If we go to heaven, will we see two separate thrones, and two separate manifestations of God? Well, it makes it sound like that's possible. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. But it depends on how you see. Here on earth, they saw Jesus' body. In heaven, you would see Jesus' body because it's up there. But would you see the Father? Can you see the soul? Well, it sounds like you can see a soul, but a soul is kind of like transparent, almost see-through. So when you go up to heaven, there's a throne up there where God sits. And here's God. But would you only see his kind of transparent outlook of him? And then would there be a separate throne over here for the Son? Well, let's look at that. So here's the Father. And then is here the Son in heaven? Let me show you a couple verses on that. And so you would be able to see both at one time, but that's still one God but yet he's manifesting himself in two different ways. 
Let me show you some scripture on that. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So there's a throne in heaven of the majesty, which would be the Father. And Jesus Christ is sitting on his right hand. So Jesus Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father. That's what the Bible teaches. So when you go to heaven, you probably would end up seeing two different ones. Let's go to uh, Hebrews 2.2. 2. But that doesn't make two separate gods. It's still one God. You're just seeing the two manifestations. You're seeing the body of God and the soul of God. If you can even see the soul of God. Like I said, it might be transparent and see-through. I don't know. Hebrews 2.2. 2. I said 2.2. 2. What I meant to say was 12.2. 2. So go to 12.2. 2. My bad. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Again, we read almost the same thing. Hebrews 12.2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. But yet he is God, but he's set down at the throne of God. Why? Because God the Father is seated, and now the Son sits. And the Son is just as much God as the Father. It doesn't make one better than the other. They're all God, but it's God that can manifest himself in different ways. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. So some people say, well, when we get to heaven, will we see two separate thrones? And some people make fun of that. No, there's no two different thrones and things like that. Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Revelation 3, 21 says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Who is speaking? Jesus Christ. In my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. <laughs> so Jesus says, there's my throne, and then there's the Father's throne. So there's two different thrones. Now some people say, no, it's one throne, it's the Father. But it makes a distinction between a throne of his and a throne of the Father. Now eventually, in the future, it's going to be one throne. We will see that. But uh, it looks like there's two different thrones. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. So if you read your Bible, you've got to understand it's one God in three. But somehow he can separate himself into three different manifestations at one time. Actually, more than that. Because when you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. How many people are saved in the world today? Just a guess. What if there's 200 million people in the world today saved? Then the Holy Spirit is in 200 million different places at one time. Because God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. All-powerful, all-knowing, and omnipresent. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now look at verse 27 and 28. For he hath put all things under his feet. This is Jesus Christ. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So it sounds like now God has separated himself. But someday, at the end of all things, God's going to take that and put himself all back together. And yet it's still one God. So God is one God who can divide himself, and someday he'll get back together. And that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting to see. So I've often wondered when you get to heaven, will you see two different thrones there? If Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, then it sounds like that he's got his throne and the Father has his throne. And one day it will all be back into one throne. But that does not, let me repeat, let me reiterate, that does not make two separate gods. There is only one God. And Jesus is God, the Father is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And these three are one. And they're referred to as persons in the Bible. But that in no way makes them three different persons in the sense that they're three completely different gods. They're not three different gods, they're one God. And you'd know that if you read your King James Bible. So there in verse uh, 19 is where I want to close. Well, actually, we'll start next time in verse 19. So I'll close there in verse 18. But let's read verse 18 again. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So what were these Pharisees saying? They were saying, if you're saying you're God's son, then you're literally saying you are God, because you're God in the flesh. So they somehow understood and knew 
that when Jesus was saying, I'm the Son of God, he's saying, I am God. And he's in the form of the Son. So I believe in the doctrine of the Godhead, one God in three, and these three are one. Do you? I hope so. I hope you understand that. I hope you gather that, because as we go on farther and farther, we're going to see that Jesus Christ is referring to himself as the Son of God. But this is the precedent, that every time we see Jesus Christ mentioned as the Son of God, it's understood that he is God manifest in the flesh as the Son. That's what this is telling us. So every time he calls himself the Son of God, the Jews are thinking, he's saying he's God? Because that's what they understood by him saying, I'm the Son. He's saying he is God in the form of the Son. All right, God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.